The evolutionary history of man that we see so typically represented in our history textbooks simply does not fit the picture of the evidence that we find in archaeology. With the possible exception of the last hundred years, maybe 200, the further back we go in history, the more advanced the technology and the more sophisticated the evidence indicates the people were. That's not the picture you see in the textbook, but what we see from the facts. And in fact, that is so obvious and so clearly demonstrated that I think maybe we ought to change the histories rather than try to juggle the facts. We find this kind of documentation and acknowledgement even from those who are humanists, who are evolutionists. That would certainly be the case with William Prescott. And in his book, The Conquest of Peru, he makes this point on a number of occasions. <clears throat> now, he is not a creationist by any means, but he is acknowledging evidence that I believe certainly sustains or supports the concept of creation, a recent creation. He says, for example, the memorials of the past remains of temples, aqueducts, other public works, which whatever degree of science they may display in their execution, astonish by their number, the massive character of the materials, the grandeur of their design. Now this is a statement that describes literally dozens of places throughout South America that, that demonstrate amazing technology as well as the coexistence of humans and dinosaurs, which uh, of course evolutionists cannot tolerate. Most of the work that we'll be looking at today <clears throat> is in the area of Peru and Bolivia. Our work was done in Peru, primarily in the area of Inca, uh, near the Paracas Peninsula, uh, in Nazca, in that area. And we see here the scenic Pan American Highway as it travels through this area. <clears throat> it is the most desolate area you could ever imagine. It hasn't rained there for a hundred years. You can't find a blade of grass. <laughs> Uh, for just on and on and on. It's amazing. And that desolation continues right on out to the coast. And this is an area that uh, we were interested in initially. Uh, and we'll talk more about a boulder that fell off of that cliff down to the beach. But as we walked along the beach, we saw about the only thing we saw were the pelicans, which I think are, are somewhat symbolic of, of desolation. Uh, where there's no rain and it's just dryness and desert. We see pictured here uh, Dr. Uh, Javier Cabrera, who was 20 years head of the Department of Medicine at the University of Lima, with his hand behind a fossil skull embedded in a tertiary boulder with a modern skull in the foreground for scale. Now, being head of the Department of Medicine, he knows what a human skull looks like. Uh, he brought that there for comparison and brought this to our attention. He says, in this tertiary boulder, which is uh, very close to, that's the next layer above the dinosaurs, uh, some 60 million years ago, we've got a human skull. Uh, well, we came down to investigate that, and by the time we had gotten there, uh, it had been sabotaged. Actually, he had made some comments to reporters. They had mentioned it in the newspaper and someone destroyed it. And here you can see the hole where that skull was. It was bashed and completely removed. We did investigate some interesting phenomenon <clears throat> in association with this, layering with uh, what we would call seashells, the philosopods, uh, that were closed and buried alive. We made a presentation to, uh, on this at the GSA, Geological Society of American Convention, uh, about 5,000 geologists showing evidence for the rapid formation of this layer based on the buried alive uh, clams and seashells, so to speak. We went on to talk with Dr. Cabrera, who is a very interesting person <clears throat> who has some uh, different ideas, we'll say, uh, uh, some that I certainly would not uh, concur in. Uh, but he has, is a scientist, he is uh, very conscientious in his interpretation of some of this evidence. And he's seen pictured here in his mansion in Inca, 
He retired to be cultural anthropologist of Ica. His father had begun collecting burial stones from the Inca tombs back in the 30s, and after his death, he continued to collect these burial stones as well as artifacts from the tombs. They appear to be connected primarily with the Nazca culture. Uh, many are familiar with the Nazca lines, which were carved in the desert, <clears throat> depicting perhaps some of the gods that they worshipped in that ancient time, but they're huge sculptures in the desert floor. On these burial stones, you see figures of the monkey and the hummingbird, for example, and the tail of the monkey up above him there seen in the, the circular form that are certainly similar to these carvings on the, on the desert floor, which uh, are amazing in that they cover uh, sometimes, uh, well, hundreds of yards up to half a mile in dimension and you can't see them from the desert floor you have to be up in the air these pictures we took as we were flying over in a in a rented Cessna uh, and there you can see the same style monkey with that circular tail you can see in this picture uh, the hummingbird uh, there on the right hand side of the picture here a spider but these are huge in dimension hundreds of yards that are visible only from the air I think they were worshiping these things uh, as representations of the gods which they thought lived in the air, and they made them big enough for them to see them. But it was an amazing technological achievement to be able to do that. Several university uh, grad students have tried to reproduce that and found it impossible. Uh, one interesting figure that uh, Eric von Donegan had featured, uh, interpreting this as uh, an astronaut and so here we have the astronaut who's waving at us and notice his head uh, with the, the space helmet on well further investigation made nonsense out of that interpretation uh, this is what we actually see when we can investigate uh, <clears throat> with infrared and uh, with other technology that shows the form even better he has a fish under his elbow on a stringer he has a net in the other hand and looking back at that again, yes, you can see under his elbow the, the fish and the net. But infrared reveals that in uh, unmistakable detail. This is not an astronaut, but this is a fisherman <clears throat> and maybe waving to a fish god, I'm not sure. Uh, but how did they do this? Well, it would take sophisticated mathematics to do some of those figures, but it would take more than that. And one of the things that we've learned is that these people used hot air balloons. They flew. Now that's astounding when we're talking about probably two to three thousand years ago. Uh, there are various dates, but uh, probably, uh, well, at least two thousand. Uh, Twenty-five hundred is, is a generally accepted date. But notice the statement here by Jim Woodman in his book, <clears throat> What Contiki Uncovered About Man's Mastery of the Sea. Nazca now reveals about man's conquest of the air. <clears throat> now, Contiki was the reproduction of these reed boats, which they made and then sailed from South America all the way to Australia to show that they were seaworthy and that these myths, some had called them, uh, were actually rooted in fact and could actually be repeated. He did that. Well, what Contiki showed about man's mastery of the sea, he says now is repeated uh, men flew 2,000 years ago, and they have found the uh, description of these and recreated them. They actually recreate the flying machines that ascended from Nazca's desert floor long ago, and he concludes these were men of stunning sophistication and intelligence. And yes, they did reproduce this. They made some and flew them just as the people from Nazca did, and from the air they could see and direct... Uh, the, the manufacture of these huge features. But this is the culture that the stones are connected with. <clears throat> they worshipped heavenly bodies. They measured the movement of the heavenly bodies in a very sophisticated manner and produced a calendar that is absolutely stunning, as was the case with other cultures in South America. Here again from uh, Hancock's book describing their calendar, strangely enough, its origins wrapped in the mist of antiquity far deeper than the 16th century. The Mayan, Mayan calendar achieved an even greater accuracy. It calculated the solar year at uh, 365.2420 days. 
a minus area uh, era of 0 0.20002 of a day, much, much more sophisticated than our calendars today. Uh, these obviously were not dummies and measured the movement of heavenly bodies with incredible